Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to New City Fellowship. If you are joining us for the first time, um, we are so glad to have you worship with us this morning. You will have slides <clears throat> appearing on your screen throughout the service to, to guide you through the different elements in our liturgy. Uh, but if you'd also like a digital copy of our Rhythms of Grace, you can download it from our website at newcityfellowship.in slash live. Um, let's now take a few moments in silence and reflection as we prepare our hearts to meet God and to hear his voice and to know his heart uh, in worship this morning. Let's take two minutes and then we'll resume our service. For those of you who've just joined, uh, welcome to New City Fellowship. We're so glad to be worshiping with you this morning. A brief thought as we enter into worship. For better or worse, um, Harry Potter has become a fascination for many of us. And so if you're familiar with the books or the movies, you'll know that in Harry Potter, there is a room called the Room of Requirement. Uh, it is a secret room in Hogwarts Castle uh, you can't find it on the map, and it appears to someone only when they are in need of it. And so uh, when you find yourself in the gates of the room of requirement, whatever you want, need, or require, it gives it to you and it provides for you. So think about that for a moment. If you were to find yourself uh, before the room of requirement, what would you want to discover inside it? What treasure will you want to find in it? What do you hope to see inside its gates? And so um, that's the question that Jesus is inviting us to consider and explore with him this morning. What is the treasure that you are after? What is it that you truly want and that you are seeking? The um, human heart, uh, to be human, the Bible assumes, is to seek after something, is to seek a treasure, that we are created and built by God to go after something, to, uh, to be treasure seekers. And it is inevitable that we, we are born with that capacity to go after something. And we think about it every day, every moment, and uh, we shape and organize our lives around pursuing something that we think will give us ultimate meaning and value and purpose. And that if we have it, that we will be satisfied. Uh, in the language of Jesus and the New Testament writers, where your heart is, there your treasure is. Our heart and our treasure is bound together. Or in the language of uh, the singer Marcus Mumford, he says, where you invest your love, you invest your life. And so those are some of the themes that we are going to explore this morning. And the claim that we will consider in our service is that unless we find Jesus as our true treasure, we will always come back empty, uh, frustrated, and wanting 
and always wanting. So let me invite you this morning to uh, take the desires of your heart to uh, come and meet Jesus who offers himself uh, as a greatest treasure to you and to us. So uh, with that said, let's uh, look into a call to worship from Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Friends, come, let us worship this Lord together. Welcome to worship. Good morning, church. Let's sing 10,000 Reasons. Thank you that you have created when you created and put man and woman in the garden you gave everything 
uh, for us to enjoy all the trees and all their fruits. Uh, you gave uh, man, woman, uh, and marriage, and covenant, and what a joyful gift that you have given. You are such a good God, and yet we have sinned. We have uh, taken what you have given us and turned it uh, into uh, to our own gods, uh, to our own idols. And yet in your redemption, Lord, you have given us every spiritual blessing uh, in Christ Jesus, and you have blessed us. Lord, you are good. For you are creator and you are redeemer. And one day we will know you as, as God fully uh, in your presence. So we pray that you would be with us here this morning and let us know that you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. sin and disobedience flow from uh, believing and acting out the reality that our resources belong to ourselves and we belong to ourselves. Or put another way that all sin and disobedience flow from the fact 
that we forget whose we are and all the resources that we have already received as being God's children. And confession is a time when we come together as God's people to confess this reality before God in the presence of each other and uh, with all honesty to our own selves. So join me as we uh, use this prayer of confession to come before uh, God uh, in truth and in honesty, knowing that he is eager to receive us and to uh, rewire us inside out to seek him and to find uh, meaning in him. So let's do that together. Gracious Father, we confess that we have longed too much for the comforts and treasures of this world rather than for your enduring kingdom. We have loved the gifts more than the giver. In your mercy, help us to see that the things we strive for are shadows, but you are the substance, that they are quicksand, but you are a mighty rock, that they are shifting, but you are our anchor. Thank you for forgiving us through the riches of Christ and freeing us to live a new life, faithfully devoted to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's take the next few moments uh, in silence, bringing our personal and private and specific sins to God, uh, knowing that the one who hears our prayers is not only a judge, but he is also our savior and our redeemer. Let's come before God in confession together and let's do this in silence. Friends, to all those who have truly taken a look uh, into your heart, but also turned and looked to Christ for help and healing, hear now these words of assurance and encouragement and pardon from Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, rejoice in Christ. We are forgiven. And God's people respond. Thanks be to God. Amen. Uh, this week, we uh, have an opportunity to affirm our faith from the Heidelberg Catechism. If you are not familiar with this language uh, of the catechisms, they are just uh, summaries of what we believe in the form of uh, question and answer. And we are doing these two questions uh, to supplement what we will hear next um, in the sermon. So let's, um, as I read it, um, you can respond um, with, what, with the text below. What does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? God forbids not only outright theft and robbery, punishable by law, but in God's sight, theft also includes all scheming and swindling in order to get our neighbor's goods for ourselves, whether by force or means that appear legitimate, such as inaccurate measurements of weight, size, or volume, fraudulent merchandising, counterfeit money, 
excessive interest, or any other means forbidden by God. In addition, God forbids all greed and pointless squandering of his gifts. What does God require of you in this commandment? That I do whatever I can for my neighbor's good, that I treat others as I would like them to treat me, and that I work faithfully so that I may share with those in need. Now we come to a time of uh, offering, and this is a time where we respond actively and practically to the kindness and forgiveness that we have received uh, from God. Uh, this is also an act of worship. So let me invite you to think uh, how you can actively offer up your hearts and your lives to God and practically bring your financial gifts to him. And you can uh, give online or you'll find a link uh, um, the details on our Rhythms of Grace, and it's also posted in our chat box. Feel free to use this time to uh, worship God through your tithes and your offerings, knowing fully well that we belong to him and all that we have is a gift from him. Let's worship together. What is our home in life? Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong, who holds our deeds within His hands, what comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to
Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is an absolute pleasure to be worshipping with you all this Sunday. And now I would invite um, City Kids to go on forward to their respective Zoom class, that they may learn the Word of God for themselves. Um, link will be provided in the WhatsApp group and also it's in the ROG, I believe as well, in the chat box. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, it is wonderful to have you all here and to be worshiping with you all this Sunday. And for those who have come here for the first time, uh, we're so glad that you're here. Um, may God bless you. And our prayer is that throughout the course of the service, you would see more of Christ's beauty and that um, you would come to hold him as um, your treasure in the, in the work of the gospel, in his work for us. Um, as we continue forward, with our study and our sermon series on the Ten Commandments. There will be a Q&A session um, after the service right here on Zoom, where our elders will be um, here to answer co your questions um, based on the sermon, based any questions that you have that are based on the sermon. So stick around. Um, you can continue to further engage and discuss concerning the commandments that God has given. Um, we also have, um, our NCF COVID Act, uh, they are our team, um, which are you know made to facilitate those who are suffering or those who need help with anything regards, uh, regarding COVID, especially with the uh, vaccination process at this time, or for those who might have tested positive and who are quarantining at home. Um, they will be here, you can reach out to them and um, you can reach out to Dr. Vijay as well. Um, his number is uh, given in the ROG. And if you have any questions, medical concerns with regards to the va vaccination or with, you know, being tested positive and how to recover from it, um, feel free to, um, you know, reach out to him. He is more than willing to answer your questions and concerns regarding um, the pandemic and vaccination. And also, um, yeah, if if uh, if you feel you need prayer with regards to um, COVID or any other particular precautions, you can reach out to the members in the COVID Act team. Uh, they are more; they will be more than happy to help you in this situation and help us all. You know, go through the uh, go through the stuff time. Um, I hope you would join me as we will pray for the city. Our heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord that um, we have gathered here, here as um, your people to um, revel and to bask in the glory and in the, and, and the beauty of your gospel. And, O oh Lord, um, to come more and more to the realization that it is indeed you who is our treasure, that in your presence there is fullness of joy forevermore. Um, we, O oh Lord, but... Also, we look around us, O oh Father, we look to our city, we look to the, the thousands and thousands of inhabitants and those who haven't found you as their treasure, those who haven't found you as um, exceedingly marvelous, exceedingly beautiful. And we pray, O oh Lord, first and foremost, for um, a great a revival, a great salvation to come to those who are in our city. Lord, people from all tribes and tongues, from all walks of life, I pray that, oh Lord, they may receive this marvelous treasure that is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you would continue to um, uphold and strengthen the efforts of the gospel, the efforts of missions in the city, that you would enable even us, Lord, to go out and to um, preach the gospel, to spread the gospel, to let the peoples know that the kingdom of God is indeed near, uh, that that they might be delivered from sin, that they might be that they might inherit eternal life, 
that they might come to see the glories of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Father, I pray that you would, in your great, great mercy, bring forth marvelous things uh, in our city, that, O oh Lord, you would bring forth many, a multitude to salvation. Father, we also ask that you would sustain the city. You would sustain the inhabitants of the city. Oh Lord, there is grievous, grievous amounts of sin in our city. And we see injustice and corruption, deceit and violence. We see greed and lust. We see, oh Lord, um, we see, oh Father, idolatry in our city. And we ask in your great mercy that the extent of his sin would be brought to a halt, Father. We ask, O oh Lord, that, Father, you would um, bring this in the sin, O oh Father, now in our city. Lord, I ask that you would bless the leaders and the authorities in our city. Bless them, O oh Father, with um, wisdom. Bless them, O oh Father, with a humble heart that they may be uh, predisposed to serve and to uh, minister and, and, and to uh, handle the responsibilities for the welfare of the people of Father. Father, I ask that you would bless uh, the people from all livelihoods in our city. I pray that, O oh Lord, those who are without unemployment in our city will find employment. Those who are left without jobs, O oh Father, in our city, let them find, uh, let them find good works and careers for themselves. I pray, Father, that Lord, um, those who are um, those who are victims of abuse, those who are um, in bondage, of Father, in our city, I pray that they will find freedom. Father, I ask for those um, who are affected, especially by this pandemic, who are sick and suffering. In your great mercies, I would, I ask that you would heal them. I ask that you would deliver our city. I ask that, oh Lord, especially with regards to COVID-19, let the number of recoveries increase, oh Father. Let the number of deaths decrease. Let the number of daily new cases decrease. Also, we pray for those who are affected by the uh, post-COVID complications, oh Lord, um, such as the mucomyrosis, the black fungus um, epidemic that has been going on, people who are suffering cardiac issues due to uh, the after effects of COVID. I pray that you would sustain them, be with them, Father. Um, I pray that you would heal them, O oh Lord. I pray for those who have lost their families and their loved ones due to this pandemic. Comfort them, O oh Father. I pray that you would reach out to them. I pray that you would be near to them, O oh Lord, and that in their suffering, in their grief and in their loss, they would find you. They, they would find you the, as the balm of Gilead as the healing for their souls, as the treasure that can never uh, be taken away from them. Father, I pray that um, you would bless our city with prosperity, um, bless uh, the peoples from all walks of life, uh, oh Lord, that they may be able to have sustainable lives and be able to provide for uh, their families, oh Lord. Father, I ask that, oh Lord, um, you would continue to lead the city towards Righteousness, O Father, and that, O Lord, we will continue to see better days in the city to come. Lord, help us as a church, uh, help us to be your light, your beacons, salt for uh, for the city, that we may spread the essence of Christ wherever we may go. Uh, equip us, O Lord, as Christians, equip us, O Lord, as your children, to be humble, to be loving, and, O Lord, um, to be... Um, be consecrated to be holy, O oh Lord. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Um, now I would invite Deepika to read the scripture for us with regards to the sermon. This is one. You shall have for me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let's look to God in prayer. Father, thank you for your word that was read to us today. We pray that by your spirit, you would uh, open the eyes of our hearts and to help us see Jesus, uh, who, uh, who is the true treasure um, that, can, uh, that, that can offer salvation to our hearts. Father, we commit ourselves into your hands to that, uh, to, to that end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, friends. Uh, thank you so much for joining us at New City Fellowship for today's worship service. Uh, we started our journey through the Ten Commandments a couple of weeks ago, and uh, today we are on the eighth of the Ten Commandments. I wonder how you felt as you we were going through uh, each of these commandments uh, week by week. Uh, personally, I found I found almost all of them very convicting, uh, and uh, I'm I'm really glad that. Pastor Rakshit gave me this uh, th th this commandment, the eighth commandment to preach. Uh, since uh, si since this commandment, uh, I hoped uh, would be a cakewalk. Uh, this would be uh, perhaps the perhaps the least convicting because if there is one commandment that most of us feel good about, it is this commandment. <laughs> most of us uh, most of us have uh, perhaps not stolen. Uh, even if it was stolen, uh, it it was very very secret and we were never caught. So uh, a lot of us feel good about it. Uh, obviously, you, you, you can see uh, I never broke into a bank uh, or held up a bank. Uh, I, was never, I was never successful in hacking my neighbor's uh, wireless internet signal like a, at any point of time. Um, or uh, see, even when the Pirates Bay or, or Open Load were having a heyday, uh, I barely ever downloaded any pirated movies from them. I just borrowed such movies from um, maybe worse sinners than me. Um, you see, we always, we always have arguments uh, to convince ourselves that this commandment really doesn't convict me. This commandment really doesn't apply to me uh, on a day-to-day on -day basis. Maybe once in a while here and there, but not really on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but as I was preparing for the sermon, there, there was one quote uh, by, uh, by one of my favorite preachers, Dr. Tim Keller, uh, which really caught me by surprise. Um, this is what he says. He says, you have not stopped being a thief, biblically speaking, when you stop taking. You have mm -hmm. stopped being a thief when you start, um, when you start giving. You have not stopped being a thief, biblically speaking, when you stopped taking, but you have stopped being a thief when you started giving. I assume that most of us, including me, uh, haven't thought about this commandment that way. Uh, 
Uh, because stealing is taking, right? What does it have to do with giving? And, uh, and, and what does this commandment have to say to me today in my day-to-day -day life, which, uh, which seems to be pretty free of theft, uh, at, least, at least from my end? Um, so, yeah, uh, what is this? Uh, so, 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 so the next couple of minutes, we will pause and explore the path that moves us that moves our hearts from stealing to giving. And on this path, we will explore, first of all, what stealing is, as the Bible puts it. And then we will look at uh, why we do it, why we do things that the Bible uh, could possibly call as stealing. And how can we transition from stealing to giving? The first point is, uh, the first point is uh, titled, The act of stealing, and the second point is titled "The Heart Behind It," and the third point is titled uh, "The Grace That Will Encounter Us." What is stealing? Um, why do we do it? And what changes us? So, how does stealing look in our day-to-day -day lives? Have you ever thought about how it looks in your day-to-day -day life? Um, I would like us to consider six areas of our lives. This is not like an exhaustive list, but we will go through these six areas and see how these areas might be speaking into our lives today. This is absolutely not an exhaustive list. So, uh, so this is, yeah, you, 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 you can just follow along as I, as I guide us through uh, various scripture passages and see what this has to say to our life today. The first place we are called to heed this commandment uh, I would say, uh, is in our office, in our workplace. First Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, Paul gives a list of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And in that list, in, in that list you will see people who are sexually immoral, people who are idolat uh, idolater, idolaters, uh, adulterers, drunkards. And along with that, in that list, you also find a group called thieves. He says that previously some of you were doing this as a habit or committing this sin as a habit, theft also. Uh, but now he says you have been washed, sanctified and justified. So he says now we need to stop doing these things, that the, 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 the traps that we kept walking into before, we should stop doing that now. Now think of all the ways in which stealing happens at office. False, ex uh, false expense claims, right? Uh, or say, uh, using a photocopier that, that's your, that, that belongs to your office uh, for the purposes that are not official at all, that are personal. Or say, uh, not applying ourselves sufficiently to our work, just getting the minimum thing done and keep on moving. Or say, um, some days, so some days you're in your office or you're in your workplace, but the whole day you're just warming the chair. <laughs> you're just sitting there, like waiting for the day to get over. You know, these things may look so common, uh, so unconvicting, but we need to give a serious thought to these things because God takes these things, things seriously. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, the New Testament teaches us that Christian employees ought to give their time and effort diligently to their work as if they are doing a service to the Lord himself. And it says that we should not slack at work when we are not being watched. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very strong instruction that comes from the apostle uh, for us to heed. Taking taking our work, our work hours, our, our, our workspace seriously. Or perhaps you are a student and you're thinking, well, my workplace, what do you mean? Uh, students availing scholarship, for example, uh, who get sucked into the same trap of, of, of slacking at your work, not realizing that your hard work is essential for the good utilization of the resources that have been spent on you. Now, 
we may choose to laugh this off because uh, if you are like me, perhaps as a student, you would have slacked uh, like a lot of time. <laughs> uh, but we cannot likely get past the fact that this commandment is pertinent to our workplaces. This commandment is pertinent to our office, to our studies, whatever that might be that is, um, it, it, it is, is something that you do most of your waking hours. The second area that the, that the eighth commandment, um, the scripture applies, uh, applies it to is the area of paying taxes. Romans chapter 13, Paul speaks of paying taxes in close connection with the command to not steal. Meaning to say, if you are, uh, if, if you, if you are cutting corners with the government and, and, and not paying the taxes that are due to the government, then you're stealing. That's what he's saying over there. You see, uh, paying taxes is also an acknowledgement uh, of the privilege of belonging to a society. I'm, I'm in this society and, and, it's, and it's a privilege. And so, and so you celebrate that by, by, by paying taxes. Sadly, I've heard someone say uh, recently that income tax returns are often seen as the most imaginative fiction uh, that's being written today. <laughs> Most imaginative fiction. Uh, most, most of it, he said, uh, are, are not really true truths that people, uh, that people claim their income tax returns. Um, now, the commandment do not steal is pertinent in the area of tax payment as well. Consider, consider this seriously as, uh, as your ITR deadline approaches. Uh, thankfully, it, it used to be end of July. Now it's moved to uh, end of September for this year. Uh, but 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 as you prepare for this, as you prepare for this, think about it. This is about honoring God. This is about uh, this is about not stealing. The third area that this commandment uh, that we are supposed to heed this commandment is in the area of business practices. Um, NCF, uh, NCF has historically been a church uh, where, where, um, where there have always been uh, people from the uh, people from the business uh, from from the business side of things. They are uh, they are into entrepreneurship and, and a whole lot of things like that. So, uh, if you run a business, consider how you treat those who work for you. How eager are you? Uh, in paying the worker or the contractor their due. In James chapter 5, verse 4, James says that the wages that are withheld from your worker are crying out against you. I wonder how, how many companies uh, have, 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 have these prayers going up to God, cry uh, from, from people whose wages have been withheld. This is this is not just about those who are doing business, but applicable to anyone who is engaging a worker or a contractor for a job uh, that you hire them for. Watch out if, you, uh, if your sole tactic in paying them is to leverage the worker's vulnerability and to somehow get the pay uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the cheapest level, get the cheapest labor possible. Um, that is exploitation. That is manipulation. And, and there is no other way that the scripture uh, would understand that. The scripture calls this prevalent business practice as stealing. Think about that. Also consider, uh, consider ethics uh, that go around business practices, um, asset stripping uh, or talent poaching without considering the social and personal repercussions uh, that it can have on people, on small businesses from whom you're poaching them, uh, or, or, or the industry that you're, or, or, the, or, the, uh, or the company that you're trying to kill. Uh, consider, consider the effects that it has on people. Consider the area of honest sales. How often do we feel okay with delivering shoddy goods or second-rate services as long as it goes unnoticed. You see, God's word takes that pretty seriously. In Hosea, the, the, the prophet, uh, again, this comes from the, um, 
this comes from uh, Leviticus, uh, but Hosea picks up on this and, and, and makes a huge deal about it. He says, Hosea chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, they talk about merchants using dishonest scales, hoping to not get caught, but make a large profit. God's word, my friend, calls that theft and extortion. I wonder what God thinks of some of the companies and industries in our city which solely exist for making enormous profit at any cost. I'm not saying that's true with all companies, but, but I, I wonder how many companies God has taken note of in this matter. The eighth commandment, my friend, spotlights the ethics of our business practices. And then let's move to the fourth area, the area of relationships and friendship. This commandment applies there as well. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, the New Testament says that anyone who has been stealing must no longer, must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Think about that. How often have we taken lightly the things that we have borrowed from others? We borrow and, uh, and, and we're not serious about returning them. I have often heard uh, preachers and, uh, uh, and, and pastors complain about, uh, about others who borrowed their books and their personal belongings and they never came back. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and they don't even remember where, where those things are right now. Now, you know, I, I, shouldn't guilt you, uh, I shouldn't guilt you here uh, too strongly because to tell you the truth, I realized off late that I have at least two books on my shelf which I borrowed, which I need to return ASAP to some of my friends. Now, our intention in such cases may not be to defraud the lenders, but we perhaps do not consider it a priority enough to return the things to their owners. You see, in these matters, the scripture does not only say that we should return the borrowed things, but it says that we ourselves should engage in purposeful work so that we have enough to give to the others. So that we become the givers. The commandment, do not steal, does not only apply uh, to stopping taking from others, but it also means that we should start giving something that often doesn't come so easily to us. Consider that. Do not steal. Now, the fifth area that I'd that, that I like to consider uh, is, the, is the area of creation care. Uh, now, this is an area that I have not often paid attention to uh, before, but I have, been, uh, I have been convicted recently as I realize how we use our natural resources and, and the fact that that matters to God. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, uh, we are told that uh, it is God's will to sustain every living creature. And then Psalm 145, verses 6 and 7 say that God satisfies the desires of all living creatures. But how does God do this? How does God sustain all living creatures? How does God, uh, how does God satisfy all their needs? Most often, it is by calling us, the people who are in the image of God, to care for the world that he has created. Um, sadly, uh, we, being, the, being in the privileged position, we haven't cared for our creation enough but we have exploited it in our day-to-day -day lives by misusing natural resources. Now, some of the natural world documentaries that uh, my family and I have been watching uh, for, the, for the last couple of weeks uh, have, have served as huge eye-openers in this matter. Electricity wastage, food wastage, petroleum products wastage. All of this, my friends, come at a cost for the Earth's creatures. All of them come at a cost for the earth's ecosystem and its inhabitants. So God calls us not to exploit and steal the resources that he gives to the whole world, not just to us. Have you given a serious thought to creation care? 
and then I'd, I'd also like to uh, I'd, I'd also like to draw attention uh, to uh, the sixth area uh, after which we're going to look at uh, why we do this and how we can overcome this. What's the sixth area that I'm looking at? Uh, it's the, it's the area of Christian giving. In Malachi uh, chapter three verses eight to nine, God brings a charge against Israel for robbing him and not presenting to him his tithes and offerings. Now, this is a sensitive issue to talk about when it is spoken of in the church context, uh, but it is also a matter of discipleship. So let me take a minute to lay out to us the scriptural teaching in this matter. First of all, tithes and offerings are an act of a believer's worship towards God. So this is a stipulation that God's word gives only to believers and not to everyone in the world. So if you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, my friend, um, you, you do not have to feel obligated to give. But Jesus invites you first to experience the love that laid down his life for you. And that's, and that's where our giving flows out from. And, and Jesus wants each one of us to experience that. If you haven't experienced that, that's what Jesus is calling you to. And secondly, the New Testament does not enforce giving just 10% of our income to God. But for those of us who have put their faith in Jesus, the New Testament calls us to give cheerfully in response to God's gracious love towards us in Christ. I like what uh, C.S. Lewis uh, said in his, uh, in his famous book, Mere Christianity. He says, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule to give, uh, only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. Now, is that the principle that drives your giving? I wonder if we have noticed uh, in, the, in the Rhythms of Grace that uh, usually in the first week of every month, the giving is high and understandably so because that's the time when most of us get our salaries and so uh, we bring our tithes uh, and understandably the, the, uh, the, uh, the offering is high on that week. But I wonder if you've noticed that in this month, for some reason, I'm not judging because I don't know all the reasons, but for some reason, giving has been uh, much lower than what it usually is. Now, I am not saying brothers and sisters to, to guilt you into giving. And please don't hear me say that we want your money to sustain the church's ministry. Your money does help the church's ministry. But my concern here is if our worship of Jesus is somehow getting colder by the day, causing us to rob God, as the scripture puts it. That's a teaching that comes from God's word that we need to take very seriously, stealing, uh, robbing God, it says. You see, stealing really comes in various forms. We have considered six forms, but there, there are multiple forms in which stealing comes. And the truth is that God takes it as seriously as he would take idolatry or adultery. He takes stealing very seriously. So now we are faced with a problem in our Christian living. But where does this problem come from? Why is there this hesitancy in, uh, hesitancy in sharing our resources? Why is there, uh, why is there this stealing as scripture qualifies it that's happening in our households within the church now the problem lies really at the heart and that's what jesus all the time addresses jesus addressed this matter very clearly uh, with, with a lot more clarity than any of the other teachers could ever uh, could ever manage in, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses this very issue. He says that all forms of stealing, materialism, being tight-fisted, extortion, robbing God, all of them are really just manifestations 
of the same problem, namely greed or the love of money. Now, greed is a very, very strong motivator of life. We see that all around us. We see that in, in the world of business, in the world of entertainment. Uh, we see that in our workplaces. Um, that's, why, uh, that's why businesses thrive on, uh, on appealing to our greed. Uh, that's why entertainment, uh, entertainment banks a lot on our greed. Uh, also, our workplaces... Uh, they, uh, they 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 throw the hook in off uh, of the money they're going to pay, and they 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 try to get any kind of work out of you, any number of hours out of you, without letting you take even Sabbath. Uh, so so ha ha having having all these things in the background, um, Jesus says that that's where the problem lies. He is spot on. But now I wonder if you're thinking to yourself, but that's not so true of me. Um, I'm not really greedy. Um, I, I, I think that's an unfair accusation on me. So uh, we need to consider the illustration that Jesus uses to show how greed works in our lives. You know, in, in John, sorry, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24, uh, while Jesus is talking about the problem of greed and how money rules our, uh, rules our hearts, Bang in the middle of that passage, he uses an illustration which often looked, looks quite strange in verses 22 and 23. Let me read the illustration for you. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, you're wondering, what is this light? What is this darkness, eyes and all of that? Uh, let's unpack that a bit. Since Jesus is talking about love of money immediately before this, uh, before this uh, illustration and also immediately after this illustration, we can safely assume that this illustration is about love of money. Uh, and he says, your eyes are the receptors of life, are, are the receptors of light in your body, and they help you to judge where things are, move towards good things, avoid bad things. That's what your eyes help you with. But if your eyes are shut, then there is no light. Then there is only darkness. Now, what's he trying to say? He's saying that greed is such a thing that paralyzes your vision. It impairs your vision. While you think you're not being driven by love of money, it can cause you to be led and be driven by it. That's how greed works. Now think about it. If someone asks you uh, if we are greedy, now we are most likely to say that we are not. Yet, we have a high tendency to choose a workplace based on the money they offer. Just a, a, a bigger pay, then let me move to that company. Uh, or even more scary is the fact that we don't necessarily ask ourselves how our choices of earning, expenditure, business strategies, lifestyle, tithing, so on, are affecting people and our neighborhoods. How our, how our use of uh, natural resources is affecting our neighborhood, our world. How our, uh, how, how our uh, spending habits uh, are, are, are affecting the larger good of the, of the society. We often don't ask those questions because they are uncomfortable questions. Do you see what's happening over there? Greed is taking hold of us and it is shutting our eyes and paralyzing our vision. And that's how greed works. You think it's not there, but it's very much ruling our hearts. Or think about this. Most of us at NCF are, are professionals. And if you are a professional, you are constantly surrounded by peers uh, who earn a lot more, uh, who got faster promotions, uh, who have easier lives than you, who have more comfortable lifestyle, whose kids uh, go to better schools than, you, than what you can afford. And the list goes on and on. That, that uh, then makes us feel like uh, we are the poor chaps in our whole peer gang. Not the whole world, but at least, at least among, the, among my peers, I'm the poor one. 
not enjoying life like how everyone else is enjoying. And perhaps you're thinking, I should have at least a bit easier life than this. Now, that in turn dictates how we earn our money and where we put our money. Why do we plan so much on putting, it, putting money into new gadgets or, or this new apartment and so on? It's this. Greed is what the world is playing on, on our hearts, and we are taking the bait every time. Now, let me acknowledge an open secret with you here. The peers that we feel have easier lives than us and more comfortable lives, they move in circles where they feel like they are probably the miserable ones. They are the ones who do not have. They are the ones who are like the underdog. And all of this while feeling like they're not greedy. Didn't I tell you what, what Jesus said? Greed is a very strong competitor for the place of God in our hearts. And it keeps us from thinking that we have the problem. That's where a lot of human misery begins. We are all caught up in this never-ending rat race without even realizing that our hearts are getting plagued by greed. Thou shalt not steal. Perhaps we do not physically loot, loot banks, but we have often broken this commandment because our hearts are plagued with greed. And our hearts are so strongly rooted in it that we can't remove ourselves from that. So how do we overcome? How do we overcome this problem of greed? Generally speaking, the world will not help us overcome it because the world thrives on us being greedy. From why don't you obey if I, why don't you obey if you want an extra candy? Right? That's where it starts. And the world keeps fanning that flame of greed within us all our lives. The world cannot help us. The world cannot help us change. It will either condemn us for being greedy or it will tell us that it's just part of life. You should just accept it, embrace it, and move on. Now, either of these options are not going to make us any feel. Either of these options are not going to pull us out of this rat race of going after possessions, of, of running after materialism. On the other hand, even we cannot change ourselves. This is because the problem is very deeply rooted in our hearts. As the famous preacher of 20th century A.W. told, the roots of our heart have grown down into things, and we dare not pull out one rootlet lest we die. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God, and the whole course of nature is upset by this monstrous substitution. So how do we, how do we overcome this monstrous problem of greed? How do we keep this eighth commandment that God calls us to keep? The Bible tells us that we can do that only when we encounter the amazing grace that can open our eyes and transform our hearts. The amazing grace has to open our eyes and transform our hearts. And for that, we're going to look at a story, a, a story real quick. This story is a famous one uh, of, of, of transformation uh, that comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. And here is a man who is helplessly conditioned to steal. And he receives power from Jesus to return his possessions and cultivate a joyful generosity instead of stealing. That's the story that we are going to look at. This is the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Let me highlight a few details from the story of Zacchaeus uh, and, and, and let's see how, how his conditioning was. He was a Jew by religion, but he chose one day uh, one of the most hated professions in the Jewish society, a tax collector. Tax collectors were men who would extort money uh, from their own fellow Jews, their own friends, family, relatives, neighbors. They don't care who that person is. They would just extort money. And, uh, uh, and they charged people much more than what the Roman government stipulated. And they gave the Roman government 
the, the, the Roman emperor his portion and the rest of the earning, they kept it for themselves. So whatever they want, they can earn. So <laughs> added to this, the tax collector was also given a Roman soldier who wouldn't mind beating up people if they did not give the money that the tax collector demanded. So the Jews obviously hated these tax collectors. They were traitors. They were the oppressors. Now think of the life of a, life of a tax collector. He chose this profession knowing that he will be hated and ostracized forever. Whatever might have led him to doing this tax collection business, he chose the he chose the profession and now he is conditioned uh, to valuing financial perks over all other relationships that he can enjoy. He loses his childhood buddies. He loses acceptance with his family members, his, his society, his clan. So here we have Zacchaeus who's conditioned to steal both by the society's branding and by his own desire. And in addition to this, we are also told that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, perhaps one of the most notorious ones than the ordinary tax collector. And on top of that, he lived in Jericho, the richest city of the time in the country. So he would have had a lifestyle that he had to keep up. Imagine someone who is so strongly driven by the love of money. You need to earn because you've left everything else for this one thing. People absolutely hated him. Do you remember uh, that time when he, uh, when he went up on a sycamore tree uh, because he was this wee little man? Most probably climbing the tree was not just to gain height. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a funny uh, image in my picture. But on any given day, people wouldn't have wanted to touch him with a 10-foot pole. So he has to like stay away from people. He's an unclean guy. He's the oppressor. So here is a guy who is consumed by his monstrous greed inside. And then he is branded and hated by the society on the outside. And now he gets curious about this man, Jesus, who is passing through the city. And he wanted to see Jesus. Maybe he heard uh, something about Jesus' friendship with guys like him. He just wanted to see uh, what this odd Jew looked like that would hang out with like tax collectors and sinners. And right at that point, he's on top of the sycamore tree. Jesus comes under the tree and he takes Zacchaeus by surprise. He comes to the tree, looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Guess what? Guess what that means? Jesus is offering a hand of friendship to Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector. And that is going to change Zacchaeus' life forever. The next thing you know about Zacchaeus is that this guy who would do anything to get money, who would extort and, 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 and exploit this guy says that he is going to return the money that he stole from people, not just return it, but return it fourfold. And also on top of that, give away half of his possessions to the poor. Now that is an astonishing transformation, don't you think so? And it happened because when Jesus came to Zacchaeus' home, Zacchaeus' eyes were opened. And he realized that this friendship with Jesus is a much better treasure than the treasure of money that he was running after all his life. Think about it. The treasure of money was something that he had to work all his life. This is something, uh, this is something uh, that to earn it and to keep it, he had to sacrifice virtually all valuable human relationships. And this treasure always threatened to leave him. You know, one recession, one pandemic, all that you earned is down the drain. It's gone. It makes Zacchaeus a slave. It makes him live in fear because now this treasure that he earned, he has to protect. Otherwise, it will go. On the other hand, 
he has this other treasure, the friendship with Jesus, which is absolutely a contrast. Here is Jesus whose friendship he did not have to strain himself for. Jesus offered the friendship knowing full well the kind of rebellious life that Zacchaeus led. This is a treasure that he did not have to choose and keep, but this treasure chose him. And this treasure, Jesus said, I will keep you till the last day. In fact, just a little while later from the story, um, this treasure, Jesus, paid the penalty of this wee little man on the tree. And Jesus laid down his life on another tree where he knew no sin became sin for Zacchaeus. Where, where the one who knew no sin became sin and curse for you and for me. You and I, nor Zacchaeus, have to learn, have to, have to now uh, live in this rat race of chasing these wee little treasures. Because now we have a treasure that will not forsake us. We have a relationship that will hold us, ground us, that will keep its promise. Not just that, this treasure has made us his treasure. So much so that he died on the cross, my friends. You know, this rat race of running after this treasure of money, the treasure that greed promises to us, how much of a bondage it has led us to, how much of fear it has led us to. We are controlled. You know, I'm inviting you into a relationship today, my friend, with a treasure who came running after you, who invites you in love, not in fear. My friend, right now, Jesus is extending the same hand of friendship to you. Maybe you have already entered this friendship before. But maybe you have not experienced Jesus as your treasure of late. Maybe you haven't looked at him and uh, looked at your relationship with him and, and filled your heart, your eyes, your mind with the beauty and the glory of this friendship. Maybe that's why we are still running after these treasures and filling our eyes with the beauty and the glory of money. Jesus says, my friend, be free because I have made you my treasure and you need not run after the treasures that are going to, uh, <laughs> that are going to enslave you. He's calling you today, my friend, and saying, I want to enjoy you as my friend and I want you to enjoy me as your friend, and in that you will know the safety of what it means to not steal and rest secure. May I invite each one of us into this deep friendship. Let's look to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ and this offer of eternal life, this offer of friendship that nothing can take away from us. Lord, the worldly treasures that we run after that we steal, uh, that we steal for, that we beg, borrow, steal. Lord, we pray that you will set our hearts free from the pursuits of things that do not satisfy. Give us this true relationship and friendship that truly satisfies us. To that end, we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, we ask this prayer. Amen. Church, let's sing, Be Thou My Vision. Let Christ be our vision, our great treasure.
Bitches. Bitches, I keep not Friends, let's receive the Lord's benediction uh, before we end this service. And right after the service, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, hang in there. And uh, uh, if you have any questions regarding today's sermon or last week's sermon, feel free to ask the questions. Uh, Rakshit and I will be there uh, to, uh, to, answer your, uh, to answer your questions to the best of our ability. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this service again. Receive the Lord's benediction. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace given us eternal comfort and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And all God's people respond saying, thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, friends. We'll start our Q&A in less than a minute. Sammy, if you can allow all the participants to be able to unmute their mics. Okay, friends. So uh, I'm using my I'm using my phone right now. So uh, if you are speaking. Most probably, I'm not able to see uh, your window on the screen. So kindly tell me your name and then go ahead and ask your question. Or if you want to make a comment or anything, just uh, yeah, just feel free to um, go ahead and speak. Okay, Rakshat is also here. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's a lot of silence uh, for a usual Q and A session. So yeah, if you have if you have any thoughts, comments, questions, yeah, please feel free to share them. If you haven't unmuted your mic, uh, you can unmute your mic and, and speak. Yes, you can post your questions in the chat box as well. Rakshit may be able to read it out if it's to me. Uh, 
if it's to him, he will take it. I just want to ensure that people can unmute. Yeah, now they can. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, that's great. No questions. So, uh, Rakshat. What's the plan? Uh, we we can end if people don't we have any end. questions. Cool. Hey guys, thank you so much. Um, Brian, you were going to say something, or you leave? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us for this service. If you have any questions or, or any thoughts that you'd like to engage with, um, please, please feel free to uh, reach out to me or to Rakshit uh, or, or any of the elders, particularly if it's for the 